So at the end of last lecture, I discussed uh, coherence conditions for the observability of neutrino oscillations. And by looking at your faces, I realized that uh, some people uh, were actually decoupled a little bit. So maybe I should try to summarize the idea of coherence conditions and try to look at them at slightly different point of view. Okay? So uh, neutrino oscillations is a quantum mechanical interference phenomenon. And interference phenomenon requires interference of some amplitudes. And in this respect, neutrino oscillations are very similar to the famous uh, electron diffraction uh, uh, double slit experiment. You remember this probably from textbooks of quantum mechanics. So there, if there is a source of electrons and uh, there is a screen with two slits and there is a final screen here on which we want to see interference uh, pattern, then the amplitude of two different paths add coherently and create here an interference pattern with fringes only if we cannot distinguish which slit has the electron pass through. If the experiment allows one to do it, for example, we put a source of light here and we see a flash when the electron comes here, then interference will be destroyed. If the interference is there, the probability is equal to the square modulus of the probability of some of these two amplitudes, and we see the interference effect. If it is broken, the coherence is broken, then we have A1 square plus A2 square and no interference at all. What happens in the case of neutrino oscillations? That's a well-known thing. Okay? What happens in the case of neutrino oscillations? They have interference of amplitudes corresponding to exchange between the source and the detector of neutrinos of different mass. So we emit some flavor eigenstate, which is a superposition of mass eigenstate, nu1, nu2, and nu3. Okay? And the amplitudes corresponding to propagation from the source to the detector of mass eigenstates nu1, nu2, and nu3 will interfere if there is no way for us to discriminate between them experimentally, for example, in the production or in the detection experiment. If the experiments allow us to find out which actually neutrino mass eigenstate was emitted or detected, then there will be no neutrino oscillations at all. So there is a direct analogy between these two things. Okay? Now let me discuss once again these uh, coherence conditions. You remember there are two types of coherence. First is um, production and detection coherence. They are very similar. Since uh, they are similar, I will call them just coherence of the same type. Uh, and possible propagation coherence or violation of coherence. So what are they? Our neutrino production process at source localized in some region of space-time. And our detection process is also localized in some region of space-time. Okay? But we don't know within this localization region where exactly neutrino is produced. There is an uncertainty, the coordinate and time uncertainty of the neutrino production process. By the way, what I'm talking about is not the size of the detector or of the source and detector. They are much bigger. This is the sizes of the individual neutrino production and detection processes, which are determined by the sizes of the wave packets of particles which participate in neutrino production. In each individual neutrino, there are many of them and the source is much bigger than this. Okay? And the same for detector. Now, this is a quantum mechanical uncertainty, and within this uncertainty in a coordinate, let's call it sigma x, so the distance like this. We don't know exactly the coordinate of the point where neutrino is produced. S similar will be for the neutrino detection. Now you remember that the oscillation probability is given in the simplest two flavor case by this expression, sine squared 2 theta times sine squared the oscillation phase, which is delta m squared over 2p times l. So the oscillation phase is here. Now what happens 
if we take into account that we don't know the distance between the source and the detector, this L, better than with the accuracy sigma x. Sigma x is the size of the production region. We have to take the account into account that the oscillation phase will actually fluctuate because the distance will fluctuate. It depends on the exact coordinate of the production and we don't know this exact coordinate. And we cannot in principle know it. It's limited by quantum mechanics, the knowledge. So what happens if we take this into account? Uh, we have to find out this is the oscillation phase, okay. We have to find out the fluctuation of this oscillation phase. And it is of the order of the fluctuation of distance L, <coughs> which is delta m square over 2p times sigma x. Sigma x is the size of the production region. So by the way, I, I write capital X here to distinguish it from the length of the wave packet, which I will also discuss, but neutrino wave packet. They are uh, typically similar, of the same order of magnitude, but not identical. Okay. So, and I want this fluctuation of the oscillation phase to be small. If it is not small, we will wash out the oscillation. We will not see any oscillations at all. So this should be much less than one. On the other hand, from the Heisenberg uncertainty relation, we know that this uncertainty in the coordinate is of the order of the uncertainty, inverse uncertainty in momentum. So it's to the minus one, sorry. Okay. And this should be much less than one. This means that delta m square over 2p should be much less than sigma p. But this is nothing but the difference between the momentum of different mass eigenstates. For relativistic neutrinos, the difference of momentum of different mass eigenstates is of the order of delta m square over 2p. Okay. So we found that the difference of momenta of two neutrino mass eigenstates should be smaller than the momentum uncertainty. And this means that our production process does not allow us to find out by kinematics, by simply studying the momenta of the particles, which mass eigenstate was emitted. Exactly as I said. So this is the coherence condition in the momentum space. This is the coherence con condition in the coordinate space. They are related. W they are equivalent, just being looked at in different uh, spaces, in momentum space and in coordinate space. Okay. Okay. This was about neutrino production coherence. The same for neutrino detection, very similar. However, neutrino propagation coherence or decoherence is something different. I discussed at my last lecture that propagation decoherence is the effect of separation of wave packets of different mass eigenstate. Different mass eigenstate, because they have different mass, they propagate with slightly different group velocities. And over long enough distance, they will separate to such an extent that they will no longer overlap. So when their separation is bigger than the length of the wave packet, they stop overlapping. Now, how can it be related to the argument which I mentioned that uh, coherence is lost if we can distinguish two different mass eigenstates? Very simple. If the wave packets of different mass eigenstates separated, we just can dis distinguish between them by time of flight. They are no longer overlapping, and one of them arrives at the detector earlier than the other. So we can, by this, by doing this, we can distinguish uh, between different mass eigenstates, and this will kill neutrino oscillations, of course. By the way, this also said that even if they separate, the detection process can help us to solve this problem, to mend this uh, problem. Because if the individual detection process, it also not instantaneous, it takes some time, related by, by the uh, energy um, uncertainty at detection, by the uh, time energy uncertainty relation. So detection process also takes finite time. And if during this finite time, the second wave packet, which was more slow, still will arrive, 
before the detection process is over, then coherence will be restored. So coherence in principle can be restored at detection. And when I say that there is a propagation decoherence, I mean that the separation of wave packet is so large that uh, detection cannot restore it. Okay? What does it mean? This, as I discussed at my last lecture, this means that the difference of group velocities over group velocity of neutrino, difference of group velocity for different mass eigen state, times the propagation distance should be smaller than the length of the neutrino wave packet. Here it's the length of the neutrino wave packet. Okay? This was in the coordinate space. Now I want to discuss the same thing in the momentum space. As I said, two dis descriptions in the coordinate space and in the momentum space are equivalent. How can we understand this in the momentum space? Okay. First of all, when I say it, well, so again we have to look at the neutrino oscillation phase. It's very convenient to look at the oscillation phase in all these situations when we want to discuss coherence or decoherence. Now, what is P here? We know that momentum doesn't have a sharp value for neutrinos. Okay? Neutrinos are described by wave packets which have some spread of momenta. The momentum distribution function F of P, actually momentum distribution is square modulus of F. We assume that it looks like this. It is some function which has a maximum at momentum P0 and the width sigma P. We are not very much interested in the exact shape of this. For the sake of the arguments, it doesn't matter. <coughs> what is important is that there is kind of function with a maximum and characterized by some width of the peak. Okay? Now, so what is this P here? P doesn't have a sharp value. Normally people mean here this P0, this mean value of the neutrino wave packet. Okay? Now, we have to take into account that mean value is not the, 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 the full story. There is also some spread given by this sigma p. Let us calculate the fluctuation of the oscillation phase because of momentum not having a sharp value. Assume that sigma p is relatively small, then we can say that fluctuation of the phase because of the momentum spread is derivative of the oscillation phase over dp times delta p, but delta p is sigma p. This is the spread. Okay? So this gives, will give us the uh, idea about uh, the fluctuation of the oscillation phase be because of the momentum spread. Now this derivative Just differentiate this expression. It is delta m squared over 2p squared times L. Sigma, sorry, sigma p times L. And this we want to be much less than 1 in order to have coherence. Now let's compare it with this. Delta V over V for relativistic neutrinos is just delta M square over 2P squared. The difference of the velocities of relativistic neutrinos. Just by expanding the expression for the relation between neutrino energy, momentum uh, and mass. So this condition here, if we put sigma p here, it will be this expression less than 1 over sigma p. But this is nothing but uh, essentially the length of the neutrino wave packet. So this condition is equivalent to this one. So again, we see the equivalence of description in the momentum space and in the coordinate space. 
in coordinate space, the propagation coherence condition is that the wave packets do not separate uh, upon propagating distance L by the distance more than their own width. In the momentum space, the condition is that the fluctuation of the phase due to the fact that momentum doesn't have a sharp value but has some spread is smaller, much smaller than one. Otherwise, if it is bigger than one or, or order one, we will have some averaging and we will not see any oscillations if the fluctuation of the phase I is large enough. Okay, so these are the coherence conditions. Well, I hope it's more clear now. Okay, okay uh, these are all qualitative arguments. They look qu quite reasonable, but it would be also good to try to see it uh, in some calculation, not just by, by doing some uh, hand waving arguments, but just to, to do an accurate and rigorous calculation and to find out that this is indeed the case. And uh, well, this was just a summary when the coherence conditions are or are not important. Uh, uh, the propagation conditions, uh, coherence condition can be violated for astrophysical neutrinos because uh, the baseline in this case is huge but for terrestrial experiments uh, it is uh, not so important and therefore uh, we don't see propagation decoherence in our solar reactor or sorry a reactor atmospheric or accelerator experiment solar experiment we do see okay and uh, the decoherence is more important the heavier the neutrino are and therefore if relatively heavy sterile neutrinos exist we may encounter the problem of decoherence by the way, just uh, a suggestion for you to get a feeling of propagation decoherence. Consider the coherence lengths. Which is found from that condition that <coughs> okay, let me write it like this. Delta M square over 2P squared coherent length, uh, baseline should be less than, much less than sigma x, the length of the neutrino wave packet. And for the coherent length, it is of order. So this is the length at which these uh, two quantities become nearly equal to each other. Okay? So if the baseline is much smaller than coherent length, there is no decoherence. If it is of the order or much bigger than the coherent length, uh, the, the coherence is lost and there is decoherence. In, sorry, in the first case I said it was coherence, if the baseline is smaller than coherent lengths. It's c then the situation is coherent. Now, my suggestion is the following. Uh, assuming that for reactor neutrinos, sigma x is of the order of 10 to minus 6, 10 to minus 8 centimeters, it can be estimated to be this. You see it's extremely small. So can we have coherent lengths which is not so small? Coherent lengths from here is sigma x times 2p squared over delta m squared. So this is a very small value, but this is a huge number. So try to estimate for reactor neutrinos, which mean the energy or momentum of order 4 MeV, delta M square, which is given by so-called atmospheric mass square difference, which is about 2.5, 10 to minus 3 electron volt squared. Try to estimate the coherent length in this case. You will need to, so you know this, you know this, you have to estimate this value. and see whether coherent length is small or large compared to the typical baselines of the reactor experiments, for example. You will find that the coherent length is at least a few thousand kilometers. So it's much, much longer, despite the sigma x being so small, just because this number is so huge. Only for neutrinos of astrophysical or cosmological origin, propagation coherence is lost.
just to get a feeling, make this simple estimate. OK, so let me come back to the calculation. Oh, by the way, uh, we know from the atmos uh, atmospheric neutron experiment that at least at the distances of the order of the Earth diameter, coherence is not lost. So we have a direct experimental confirmation of quantum mechanical coherence over the distance of 13,000 kilometers, which is the Earth diameter. Very impressive. So you remember I discussed in my previous lecture the expression for the oscillation uh, probability calculated in the language of uh, wave packets. And the result is here. So just to remind you, the amplitude of neutrino oscillations from flavor alpha to beta depend on coordinate and time and can be written as sum over all mass eigenstates, nu star alpha i, uh, nu star nu beta i, a i, where a i is the contribution of the mass eigenstate i. i is 1, 2, 3, for example, in the three flavor case. Yeah? And a i is equal to integral So that, this is what I discussed in my previous lecture. Okay? So if we take square modulus of this and integrate over unobserved time, we obtain this expression here, where this quantity here, I twiddle with the indices ik, is given here. Uh, now, if this quantity is 1, so if we substitute one here, we get the standard oscillation probability. If it is not one, we get something else. We get something different. Now let's look at this quantity. Uh, the factors R, R, K, so it contains four uh, momentum distribution amplitudes for, for the source, for the produ produced neutrino state, I and K, and the same for detected state, I and K. Q here is momentum uh, difference between the momentum of the particle and the mean moment, the peak momentum. So it's a shifted momentum, deviation from the peak. It's convenient to use this variable. Okay? So these are the peak momenta for I neutrino I and neutrino K, two different mass against states. Now you see here delta E over E to V enters with minus, and here it enters with plus. This is the energy difference of two different mass eigenstates, i and k. Also, there is a factor here, the exponential oscillating factor, which contains delta v over v, which I discussed, which is delta m square over 2p, essentially, times this q, and times the propagation distance l. So this integral here depends both on the distance and on the neutrino energy through this quantity. So if it is a non-trivial quantity, different from one, we will get something which is different from the standard oscillation probability. Only if it is one, we get the st standard formula. Moreover, if it is suppressed, this would mean the, for, for the off-diagonal terms, if it is suppressed, this would mean the interference terms are suppressed. So this means that coherence is lost. Okay? So let's look at this. Let's start with this factor. If it is a the exponent here is very big, then we have very fast oscillations, and fast oscillations of the integrand always lead to suppression of the integral. So in order for this factor not to suppress the integral, we need the exponent here to be less than 1. Okay? And what is this exponent? Uh, we know that Q is deviation of the momentum from its peak value, and it cannot be bigger than sigma p, much bigger than sigma p. If it is bigger than sigma p, f gets suppressed. Therefore, we can put the upper limit for this q here, which contributes into the integral, uh, to repl by replacing it by, by q. So we need delta v over v sigma p, 
uh, uh, by replacing it by sigma p. A sigma p is the width of the peak. So we need this quantity here to be much less than 1. But this is exactly the statement that the um, baseline of the experiment is much smaller than the coherent length. So this expression just gives you in the direct form proof that if the pr propagation coherence condition is uh, violated, then we get suppression of the of diagonal terms in this integral, which means that there will be no interference, no oscillations observed. If, on the other hand, this condition is satisfied, if it is much less than 1, we can just replace this exponent by 1, and the expression will no longer depend on the coordinate. There will be no coordinate dependence anymore. The coordinate depends only, only here, as in the standard oscillation probability. What about the energy dependence? Let's look at these four uh, terms, four factors. Okay. We have the wave packet in the momentum space for the produced neutrino with shifted arguments. Here it is minus delta E, here it's plus delta E. So if this difference between the arguments is bigger than the width of this peak, then we'll have two functions which will be widely separated and the overlap of these factors will be strongly suppressed. This will again suppress the integral. So in order not to have strong suppression, we will need to assume that delta E over 2V is much smaller than the width of this peak. Otherwise, we will get some suppression again. Okay? And if we write this condition, we again get condition that delta energy is much smaller than sigma E, which is the propag uh, production and detection coherence condition. So you see that it's not just qualitative argument from the accurate and rigorous calculation, we get the same result. And it immediately follows from this formula. Now, if this condition is satisfied, if it is much less than 1, then all the energy dependence disappears, and this integral is just a constant. And this is when we get the standard oscillation formula, when both production uh, detection coherence and propagation coherence conditions are satisfied. I have just proven that this is a constant in this case, but I didn't prove that it is 1. And we need it to be equal to 1 in order to have the standard oscillation probability. Can we prove this? It turns out that in the quantum mechanical wave packet approach, we cannot prove it. Normally people use the uh, normalization. This is related to the normalization of our wave packets, this constant. Okay? Normally we get uh, we, we assume for the normalization something like this. Standard normalization is d3p over 2 pi cube squared modulus of f of pi of fp, sorry, is equal to 1. That's the standard normalization. We can choose some, some different normalization if we prefer. We sh should only do it consistently to get the correct answer. However, whatever normalization we take, we never get the correct result because the normalization which is necessary to obtain the standard formula is given by this. It depends not only on one wave packet at production, but also at wave packet at detection. And the reason for this has nothing to do with neutrino oscillations. This only has to do with the fact that our states are described by wave packets which do not correspond to sharp momenta. They have some momentum spread. And therefore, just forget about oscillations. Assume that we have a neutrino, just one neutrino species, which is emitted, which is described by wave packet, some spread momenta of momenta, and it's detected in a process which also corresponds to some spread in momenta. We need these two spreads to overlap in order to have a detection. It's like in the case of uh, sharp energies, that would be a threshold. If your detection threshold is higher than the, the, the energy of produced neutrino, you don't see anything at all. Okay? Here it's kind of smear situation, but we need this to be one. And this we can achieve by normalizing this uh, integral by hand, by imposing the correct normalization. Okay? This sounds like an ad hoc prescription. Description. It's not very nice. We can do it. The simplest way to do it is to impose the unitarity condition. 
The unitary condition is that the sum of the probabilities of all neutrino oscillations is equal to 1. So if P alpha beta is a probability of neutrino oscillation from flavor alpha to beta, then it's equal to 1. The probability that neutrino will either oscillate to another flavor or will remain in the same flavor, if we sum all of these probabilities together, it will be 1. Okay? And by doing this, we can get the correct normalization factor. However, it's a little bit annoying. Why we, we, we have to do it, actually? The answer is that if we do it in the quantum field theoretic approach, not in the quantum mechanical wave packet approach, it's automatic. You'll get this automatically. And it also explains how to get it in the, uh, how to justify the procedure which we used in the quantum mechanical wave packet uh, picture. The point is that wave, wave packets FS and FD do not only contain information of, about neutrino propagation, but also about the neutrino production process and detection process. But the oscillation probability should be rid of this uh, considerations. We are only interested in the probability of neutrino going from one flavor to another. Forget about the process in which they were produced. The oscillation probability shouldn't depend on this process. It's another question whether it is always correct or not that the oscillation probability doesn't depend on the way as nu which neutrino is produced. Typically the oscillation probability which we consider only depends on the energy of neutrino and the distance. And we don't say what was the process in which this neutrino was produced. Okay? Th there's a good question. Is it always correct or not? Can we always introduce such a quantity which doesn't depend on neutrino production and detection? In other words, can we factorize the overall probability of neutrino production, propagation, and detection, P total, as the production rate times the oscillation probability from alpha to beta, and then cross-section of detection in the flavor beta. Can we factorize? If we can, we can divide this by gamma alpha sigma beta, and then this would give us the, the sorry, not correct. And this will give us the oscillation probability. So the question is whether this factorization is always possible. I don't have time to discuss it, but the answer is that if the coherence conditions are satisfied, then it is possible. So once again, we are led to the conclusion that if the coherence conditions are satisfied, we always get the standard oscillation formula. Can we break this coherence condition? Can we go beyond the standard formula? If we only deal with the usual neutrinos, if we don't discuss heavy or relatively heavy sterile neutrinos, it's hardly possible. And this is because neutrinos are so light. The coherence conditions put upper limits on the neutrino mass square differences. And they are so small that in all practical situations, we deal with coherent superpositions of produced and detected neutrinos, except for neutrinos of astrophysical origin, as I said. Okay? Uh, moreover, let me skip all this stuff. I don't have time to discuss Lorentz invariance of the oscillation probability. So, as I said, the standard formula is stubbornly robust. It's very difficult to find a situation in which it doesn't work. Okay? And the validity conditions which I used in my derivation were that neutrinos are either ultra-relativistic or quasi-degenerate in mass. And the coherence conditions for neutrino detection, propagation, and det and det uh, production, uh, propagation and detection are satisfied. Now, assume we somehow managed to completely destroy coherence. What would happen in this case? In this case, the oscillation probability would be not actually the oscillation, but flavor transition probability. It would correspond to the result which can be obtained from the standard formula by averaging over all the oscillations. If you take all the oscillating factors and average them, you would get the result which you would obtain in the absence of uh, coherence when coherence is violated. So the standard formula can actually also describe its complete decoherence. We just average over all oscillations. 
The only case when it doesn't work is when decoherence is of order one. In this case, we cannot use the standard formula to get very accurate result, but still it gives the correct answer by order of magnitude, even in this case. Okay, uh, but the point is that partial decoherence, where decoherence parameter is of order one, is, is very difficult to realize. It's a very special situation. Okay, let me then move to a different thing. If there are any questions about this, please ask. Okay, I'm going to change the topic now. Everything clear? Okay. Okay. So I will skip some material. I told you I will have to skip some material in any case because my program was unrealistically large. So we discussed some theoretical issues of neutrino oscillation. Now I want to move to phenomenological issues. Uh, as we discussed before, the parts of the Lagrangian which are important for neutrino oscillations are the charge current interaction and the mass terms for charge leptons and for neutrinos. In general, in the flavor basis, these are over diagonal, but then we can diagonalize them and have just diagonal mass terms for charge leptons and for neutrinos. This is the Dirac case for simplicity to start with. But instead, we get the leptonic mixing matrix, which is a product of two unitary matrices diagonalizing the charge lepton and neutrino masses, mass matrices, uh, which we call U, this product, leptonic mixing matrix or PMNS matrix. And new left and E left here are mass eigenstate fields. However, we can apply this matrix on the right to the neutrino fields and call what is obtained the flavor state. New I, new alpha uh, left-handed is a linear superposition of mass left-handed component of the neutrino mass eigenstates. Okay? And this is for the fields and for the states which are produced by acting on vacuum by uh, conjugate, the Hermitian conjugate of the field operator. We get here, the only difference is that we, we get here uh, the complex conjugation. Okay? So we say that new alpha, where alpha is electron mu or tau, or maybe in general also sterile neutrino, is the one for, for active neutrinos, e mu and tau, which is emitted together with a charge lepton of flavor alpha, electron, muon, or tau uh, lepton. Okay? And as we discussed, the oscillation probability, standard oscillation formula is given by this expression. Now, this was for Dirac neutrinos. What happens if we have Majorana neutrinos? The difference is that we don't have right-headed neutrinos, and the mass term here has this form. It doesn't have any right-handed components. Right-handed components actually are C conjugates of the left-handed components of the same field. <coughs> but again, we have a mat left-handed matrix ma diagonalizing uh, the, these mass matrix of neutrinos. Here it's already diagonalized, which enters here. And again, the total number of the mass eigenstate of neutrinos is equal to the initial number of flavors. So we have a situation which is very similar to the standard Dirac case. And the oscillation probabilities in this case, when neutrinos are Majorana particles, and they are only known neutrinos, no extra neutrinos, like sterile neutrinos, the situation is exactly the same. The oscillation probability is given by exactly the same formula. We again introduce the flavor uh, eigenstate fields and flavor eigenstate states, and we get exactly the same formula for neutrino oscillation probability. <coughs> okay, this was pure Dirac case and pure Majorana case. What happens if neutri the neutrino matrix has both Dirac uh, uh, left-handed entries and st singlet right-handed entries. Okay? That's the most general case. In this case, we assume that we have n left-handed fields, neutrino fields, and k right-handed. k may be equal to n or may not be equal to n. Just general situation. Okay? And we have again uh, the charge current interaction. 
Now, the difference is that the number of mass eigenstates in the neutrino mass, mass matrix is not equal to n. It's equal to n plus k. We have n plus k different Majorana neutrinos in this case. If we have Majorana mass terms present, the mass eigenstates are always Majorana particles, always. So in this case, we have n plus k mass, mass eigenstates. Okay? We can absorb the flavor neutrino state. Flavor means electron, muon, and tau, and sterile, which are given by this, into a left-handed uh, column vector, which contains the fields for the um, flavor left-handed active neutrinos, and conjugate of the right-handed, which are also left-handed, conjugate of the right-handed sterile states, uh, sterile fields here. And uh, we can diagonalize the mass matrix written in terms of this n by, by rotating by with this unitary matrix u, which is now not n by n matrix, but which is n plus k times n plus k matrix. Okay? Because we have n plus k uh, massive states. And we can diagonalize it in this way. This is the usual way when in which symmetric mass matrices are diagonalized. In this general case, it is symmetric, this mass matrix, as we discussed already. And the field sky, mass eigenstates, contain left-handed components, and their conjugates, which are the right-handed, and their n plus k such fields. And the mass term, which is written in terms of the flavor states in this way, can be diagonalized by this rotation, and it obtains the form of the uh, in some of the individual masses for these fields chi, mass eigenstate fields chi. Now, what happens with oscillations in this case? I actually discussed already when I discussed the Shiso mechanism, I discussed this situation. But I didn't discuss what happens with situation, uh, with the oscillations in this situation. Okay? Uh, for convenience, out of all these indices A, which are n plus k, take n plus k values, denote collectively first n, which correspond to left-handed active neutrinos by alpha, and the last k uh, by sigma. So we will, when, whenever we put this index sigma, we understand one of the last k indices here. Okay? Then the active neutrino left-handed states can be written uh, as components of u times chi mass against state field with alpha taking the first n values. We assume there are n active neutrino left-handed states. And the charge conjugate components of the right-handed neutrinos can be written as the sum uh, of this kind where sigma takes last k values. Okay? For example, if there, is three, if there are three active neutrinos, nu e, nu mu, and nu tau, and one sterile neutrino, then alpha takes values uh, e mu tau, and sigma takes value s. If there are more than one sterile neutrino, it takes many of them, s1, s2, s3, and so on. Okay? Now, we can consider neutrino oscillations between active neutrinos in this case, and the formula will be exactly the same as before, and the only difference is that the sum here runs not from 1 to n, but from 1 to n plus k, because the index i here, which corresponds to mass eigenstates, takes n plus k values. Otherwise, the formula looks exactly like it is for, for the uh, standard situation. Okay? Uh, but, uh, sorry, that was f already f something new. The standard formula will be the same for the standard oscillations. But now, there are two new possibilities. One is oscillations between active and sterile neutrinos. And this is the formula of oscillation between active and sterile neutrinos. And here we start with active neutrino, alpha, and we end up with a sterile neutrino, sigma. And the oscillation probability is given now by this expression. It looks very similar to the standard formula, but the indices take different values. And of course, the, the masses are different here. The, the n plus k mass eigen state and the mixing matrix are different. But there is one more possibility. Oscillations o between only sterile neutrinos. If both initial and final state, which are called uh, sigma and rho, belong to the subset of the sterile states, 
Then we get a very similar formula, in, except that the indices here are in the last uh, in the set of the last k values. Okay, so in this case we can have three different neutrino oscillations uh, in the system: oscillations between active neutrinos, between active and sterile neutrinos, and between sterile neutrinos themselves. Okay, is it clear? Yeah. Question. You, you can construct, uh, so the question whether the particle is Majorana or Dirac depends on whether there is a relation between its left-handed and right-handed component. You, in principle, you can uh, organize sterile neutrinos to be Dirac. Or, or you, you can have the Majorana. Again, the same as the general, general criter criterion which applies uh, to neutrinos or to any spin one-half fermion to see whether it's Dirac or Majorana. It's whether it's right-handed and left-handed components are completely unrelated or charge conjugate of each other. Okay, let us, for concreteness, consider the simplest two-flavor case. In this case, the expression for the flavor eigenstate in terms of the mass eigenstates can be written in this way, which means that for the unitary matrix U, which connects the flavor basis and the mass eigenstate basis, I take this form. So it's cosine sine minus sine of cosine of the mixing angle, which uh, I, for brevity, uh, denote by Cs minus Sc. Okay? This is actually not a new unitary, it's, more, it's a special unitary case, it's a, an orthogonal matrix. The most general 2 by 2 unitary matrix also contains some phases. But in the case of two flavors, all these phases can be eliminated. We will discuss this point a little bit later. So we can always choose it to be real, which means that it's orthogonal rather than unitary, general unitary 2 by 2 matrix. Okay? And the transition probability, if you just apply the standard formula, which I discussed many times by now already, to this uh, simple mixed matrix and take into account that we have only two mass against state with masses M1 and M2, and calculate the oscillation probability, just applying this formula, you obtain this result. So I suggest as an exercise for you to do this simple calculation. It's indeed very simple, but it will give you some feeling how, how these oscillation probabilities are calculated in a more general case. Okay? Another problem for you. I was using the units, the natural units, in which h bar and c are equal to 1. Try to reinstate h bar and c in this expression and look what happens in the classical limit when h bar goes to 0 and in the non-relativistic limit when c goes to infinity. What happens with oscillation probability? Just a question for you. When you have a few three minutes, try to do this. Okay, so the oscillation phase is the argument of the second sign, can be written as distance L divided by the oscillation length times pi, where oscillation length, just by definition, is given by this expression. And it can be written in convenient units uh, as about 2.5 meters times neutrino momentum in MeV or neutrino energy, which is the same for relativistic neutrinos, divided by mass square difference in electron volt squared. Or instead of MeV, you can use GeV, and uh, instead of meters, you can use kilometers, and number will be the same. Now, what's the physical meaning of the oscillation length? The oscillation length is the distance between, between two nearest maxima of the oscillation probability or, or, or oscillation probability or minima of the survival probability. This is the oscillation length. Okay. Now what happens if the oscillation phase here is very, very large? If it is large, then even small fluctuations of the phase will lead to averaging. And we have to take into account that all the experiments have finite energy resolution. So we have to take this into account and integrate over the energy resolution of our experiment. And also all the sources and detectors are not point-like, they have finite size. And we normally do not know where exactly in the detector uh, neutrino is detected or where exactly in the source neutrino is produced. So we have to, to integrate over these uncertainties. And this would mean that we'll get some averaging and instead of the transition probability given by sine squared 2 theta at sine squared of the oscillation phase, it will be just one half of sine squared 2 theta. 
if the averaging is complete. So it is shown here, the survival probability behaves like this, and the transition probability looks like this in this limit. Now, what I want to discuss next is something which is not directly related to the previous discussion, wave packet and so on. We already discussed that in reality, neutrino wave packets are very, very short. And so, as I said, for accelerator, for, sorry, for reactor neutrinos, for example, they are expected to be as short as about 10 to minus 8 centimeters or so. And they, this means that the, the size of the neutrino pa wave packet is much, much smaller than all the parameters of the dimension of length which are of interest to us in our neutrino oscillation, like baseline, for example, or the size of the detector. And to a first approximation, one can consider neutrinos to be point-like. Forget, for the time being, about the wave packet. It, it's, it is wave packet, but it's wave packet of nearly zero lengths. What we cannot discuss in this picture is neutrino wave packet separation. But assume that we are in a situation where this effect is inoperative, no wave packet separation, like terrestrial experiments. In this case, we can very well describe neutrinos as point-like particles moving along the classical trajectory. And then we can describe the evolution of the neutrino system, the flavor evolution, by using the Schrodinger-like equation. Here, nu e and nu mu, not to be confused with notation which I used before, it's not the field or, or, ampli or, field or, or state of neutrino, it's the probability amplitude of neutrino being found in state of electron flavor or in state of muon flavor. Just complex numbers, square moduli of which give us the probability to find neutrino of a given flavor. Then we can write down kind of Schrodinger equation for this, assuming that for neutrinos indeed distance propagated by, by them is nearly equal to the time during which they propagate. Or we can write it instead of this using the coordinate variable here. It doesn't matter, it's the same in this approximation. And we have this simple evolution equation in which we have to write down the neutrino evolution Hamiltonian in the flavor states. We know that in the mass eigenstate basis, it's diagonal, it's just E1 and E2, which e, where E1 and E2 are energies of two different mass eigenstates. Okay? However, in, we are in the flavor states. So we have to rotate it by flavor transformation by applying this unitary matrix which connects the mass eigenstate basis and the flavor eigenstate basis. And if we do this, uh, it's convenient also to use the fact that neutrinos are uh, very relativistic and expand the energies here by using this formula. And as, as a result, we obtain some expression which contains uh, these terms and something on top of that which I'll discuss in a minute. First, look at these two terms, <coughs> P here and P there. We can drop these terms because whenever there are some terms on the diagonal of the Hamiltonian, which are the same, whatever is the term which is proportional to the unit matrix in the Hamiltonian, it doesn't affect neutrino oscillations. It will lead to shift simultaneous shift of the phases of both states, nu e and nu mu, by the same phase. Yet we are, we are only interested in phase differences. Therefore, when we consider flavor transitions, we can always add or subtract to the Hamiltonian describing the neutrino evolution any matrix proportional to the unit matrix. Whatever is convenient for us. The result for the oscillation will not change. Of course, the overall phase of these fields will change, but the oscillation probability will not. And I suggest for you to check this as an exercise, another exercise, very simple one. Okay. Do this transformation. And therefore, we can drop the terms which are proportional to unit matrix. In addition, it's convenient to add such a term proportional to unit matrix, which would make this Hamiltonian traceless. And therefore, this will give us minus delta m square over 4e here and plus delta m square over 4e here. When we select the unit matrix which we subtract from the Hamiltonian in such a way as to get the traceless Hamiltonian in the end. Okay? 
And after we rotate it with uh, two by two mixing matrices, which I discussed before, this is what we obtain. The derivative of the state vector in the flavor states, nu e nu mu, is given by the effective Hamiltonian describing neutrino oscillations times nu e nu mu. So sine of twice uh, theta and cosine of twice theta depend on the mixing angle theta. And everywhere we have delta m square over 4e. Yeah. Now another exercise which I want to suggest to you. This is a system of two coupled equations with constant coefficients, which can be easily solved. Two differential equations, coupled differential equations with constant co coefficients. Solve it with the initial conditions where initially we have uh, only the, the column vector 1 and 0, which correspond to the only electron neutrino in the initial state, and find the transition probability and survival probability. And you will find out that this will give you the already known result. Now, why all this complication? Why do I need this Schrodinger equation when I can directly calculate oscillation probability? The answer is it will be very useful for us when we start considering neutrino oscillations in matter, the M's double effect. Okay. <coughs> okay, so whenever we have a matrix, two by two matrix with real numbers as the elements, the mixing angle which diagonalizes it can be found from the expression that tangent of twice of this mixing angle is twice the off-diagonal element divided by the difference of the diagonal ones. And the eigenvalues are expressed through these elements of the matrix in this way. That's a simple rule. You can prove it for general matrix like this. But it will be very useful when we consider two flavor neutrino oscillations. We don't have to do all the oscillations again and again. We just use these already known formulas. Okay? For example, for the eigenvalues of the neutrino Hamiltonian, we get uh, values plus or minus delta m square over 4e. And the oscillation length is just 2 pi divided by this difference, and which is 4 pi p divided by delta m square, which we already know. Now, this was a very simple case of two flavor neutrino oscillations. Now I want to shift to three flavor neutrino oscillations and discuss its phenomenology. Uh, let me start with the general n flavor case. In the n flavor case, the leptonic mixing matrix is an n by n unitary, general unitary matrix. <coughs> it contains some number uh, of parameters which can be interpreted as rotations or angles. And the rest are phases. Altogether, n by n complex unitary matrix uh, depends on n square real parameters. Okay? And the number of the mixing angles, of the angles, rotation angles, is equal to the number of the planes in the n-dimensional space, which is given by this uh, binomial coefficient, which is just n times n minus 1 divided by 2, just number of combinations of 2 out of n, because each plane is uh, defined by two orthogonal uh, orts. Okay? So this is the number of the mixing angles, and therefore the rest are the complex phases. Okay? So in the n flavor case, number of mixing angles is given by this expression. For example, in the 3 flavor case, it is 3 times 2 divided by 2, so 3 mixing angles. Okay? And the number of phases are given here, but not all of them will be observable. Some of them can be eliminated. The point is the following. Remember, the mixing matrix appears in the charge current uh, interaction, Hamiltonian, uh, in Lagrangian, uh, between the charged lepton fields on the left and neutrino fields on the right. We can always rephrase charged lepton fields, each of them, for each charged lepton, we can rephrase it field by some independent phase uh, phi. So instead of electron or ch well E charge lepton alpha L, we write exponential I phi alpha E alpha L. By doing this, we can freely choose phases of one line in our uh, mixing matrix. Now, are we allowed to do this? If we do this, we will also change the mass matrix of charged leptons. But we can always compensate it by assuming that right-handed fields are, uh, are transformed by the same 
exponential factors. So we transform both left-handed and right-handed components of the chart field, and our Lagrangian will remain unchanged. This means that we can freely choose, for example, we can make one line in our, in our mixing matrix completely real by doing this. And it's completely up to us, and it wouldn't change any physics. It wouldn't change Lagrangian. And therefore, these phases are unobservable. Next, we can try to do this with the neutrinos. And here the situation is very different for Dirac neutrinos and for Majorana neutrinos. Let us first assume that neutrinos are Dirac particles. Then we can do something similar to them. We can transform all left-handed neutrino fields, nu i left, by some phase uh, and eliminate not n phases from the matrix, but n minus 1. Why is it so? When we first transform the charge septum fields, we fix the phase on one line in the mixing matrix. When we transform uh, the neutrino fields, we, ch we fix the phases of one column. But on the intersection of this line and this column, the phase is already fixed. We cannot, can no longer modify it. Therefore, we can only modify phases of n minus 1 neutrino fields. And therefore, total number of uh, phases which can be removed by this is n plus n minus 1. So altogether, 2n minus 1 phases are unphysical <coughs> in the case of Dirac neutrinos. Uh, Again, like for charged leptons, the mass terms for Dirac neutrinos can be still left invariant if we use the same frame trans phase transformation for right-handed fields. And of course we can do it because right-handed fields do not enter into the charge uh, current interaction Lagrangian. They are completely unobservable in this case, uh, case. So it's up to us completely. So in the Dirac case, out of n times n plus 1 over 2 complex phases, 2n minus 1 are unphysical. So the remaining number of phases is this difference, n times n plus 1 over 2 minus 2n minus 1, and it is given by this expression. n minus 1 times n minus 2 divided by 2. And since it is only possible in the Dirac case, these CP violating phases are called Dirac type CP violating phases. Those which cannot be removed by rephasing charge lepton and neutrino fields. And we immediately see that in the two flavor case, there are no CP phases, no physical CP phases. All CP phases, or all complex phases which are in the mixing matrix can be eliminated without any trace. However, if we have three or more neutrino species, then this is non-trivial quantity. For example, for three neutrino flavors, this is one. So in the case of the usual standard situation with three neutrino flavors, we have, we have one Dirac type CP violating phase. So this was about Dirac neutrinos. What about Majorana neutrinos? The situation with charged leptons is exactly the same, but the situation with neutrinos is different. We can no longer rephrase neutrino fields at all because we will modify the mass term. The mass term, unlike in the Dirac case, in which we had new bar, new, we have new times new. So if we transform new by, by multiplying by some phase, we cannot cancel it here. It will double this phase. Okay? A and therefore, it is not allowed. We will modify Lagrangian. So it is a physical phase. We cannot remove it by, by just transforming fields in this uh, way. And therefore, in the Majorana case, we can only remove n phases. And n minus 1 phases, which we could remove in the Dirac case, remain physical. We <coughs> cannot them remain, uh, remove. Uh, and uh, these phases are called Majorana type phases, those which cannot be removed by rephasing. And since otherwise it would be possible if they were Dirac phases, this means that they can be assembled into a matrix which is a diagonal matrix. We can write down the general unitary uh, mixing matrix in this case as a matrix without Majorana phases times the diagonal matrix of phases. There are n minus 1 phases and we, we can write them as a diagonal matrix because diagonal means because we, we write, we, we act on the right on neutrino fields and 
by doing this diagonal, we, we just change the phases. We would be able to remove them if the neutrinos were Dirac, but now we cannot. They remain there, but we, they can be assembled into this uh, diagonal phase matrix K. Now, there are n minus one of them, and I put the first element equal one, and the rest are phases, phase factors. It's a pure convention. It's up to us where to put this one. We could have put it anywhere. It doesn't matter. The physical result will be the same. But since it's some convention, the values of the phases will not be the same, of course, if we put one in a different place. Uh, place. So we have to adopt some convention and then stick to it. So one uh, possible convention is this one. Now, next thing is how can these Majorana phases, if neutrinos are Majorana particles, how can they affect neutrino oscillations, if they can? Let's come back to the Schrodinger-like evolution equation description of neutrino oscillation. Here, the total leptonic emission matrix is given by this product. And if we write it down, we, we have to write it um, on the left from the diagonal matrix of the energy eigenstates uh, in this way. And the Hermitian conjugate on the right from it. And here K and K dagger are close to this matrix, okay? And since diagonal matrices always commute, we can commute this matrix with this way, uh, with this one and cancel it. And the result is independent of this K. This means that Majorana type phases never affect neutrino oscillations. On the one hand, it's good, because this would be some extra uncertainties in our description of neutrino oscillations, because we don't know these phases. On the other hand, it's bad, because we cannot use neutrino oscillation to find out these phases. But that's the, f the fact of, of, uh, of life, actually. So Majorana phases do not affect oscillations. What sorts of experiments are sensitive to the Majorana phase? Uh, the only experiment known to be affected by this is uh, double neutrinos double beta decay. Well, there are some other uh, experiments. Um, for example, uh, radiative decay of neutrino can also affect, but it's so tiny. I mean, the probability is so tiny. Lifetime is, t in most of the models, is much bigger than the lifetime of the universe. So uh, the only practical way, probably, is neutrinos double beta decay in which the Majorana type phases can be probed. And moreover, they give the main uncertainty in the predictions for the neutrinos double beta decay. The fact that we don't know them gives us the error bus in our predictions for the neutrinos double beta decay. Okay, any other questions concerning this? Okay, if not, I move further. So let's consider three flavors. That was a general <coughs> case. Let's now consider three flavor situation. The standard situation in which we do not assume any exotics like sterile neutrinos. So in this case, we have three neutrino flavor states, electron, muon, and tau neutrino, which are linear superpositions of three mass eigenstates, nu1, nu2, and nu3. The mixing matrix is three by three unitary matrix, which depends on three mixing angles and one Dirac type CP violating phase. Uh, from experiment, we know that out of these three, two mixing angles are relatively large. And one of them is relatively small, but not too small, as we know now. I will discuss tomorrow probably the experimental data in more detail. Now, just to give you some very general idea. And for three neutrino <coughs> mass against states, we have two mass square differences, which we can call delta m square 2, 1 and delta m square 3, 1. The third one, that uh, m squared 3, 2, can be expressed through these two mass square differences. And from the experiment, we know that this one is much smaller than this one. This one was measured in the solar neutrino experiment and the, uh, in the long baseline reactor experiment, Camland, the only one. And this was measured uh, first in atmospheric neutrino experiments and then in uh, long baseline accelerator experiments. And here is a very short summary. Delta m square 3, 1, the biggest one, is of the order 2.5, 10 to minus 3 electron volt square. And the corresponding mixing angle theta 2, 3 is roughly of order of 45 degrees, 
which means that we are close to maximal mixing. The latest data say that maybe it is not exactly e equal to 45 degrees, but deviates from it. I plan to discuss it tomorrow. Uh, the small one, which is responsible for the solar neutrino oscillations, is about factor 30 smaller than this one. And the mixing angle theta 1, two responsible for these oscillations, is around 30, 33 degrees. And the data about this last mixing angle uh, give us the result which is of order around 9 degrees. And uh, the previous uh, bound which we had for a long time, we didn't, <coughs> didn't see this mixing angle at all. We couldn't measure it. And we only had an upper bound which was coming mostly from the show experiment. And it was 12 degrees. So the true value turned out to be not much below this. Just a little more effort and we, we actually measured it. Now, the CP evaluating phase, there are some hints that it is close to 270 degrees. But again, it is uh, very preliminary, even though the latest data makes this claim a little bit stronger. Uh, but still, it's fair to say that we do not really know the CP violating phase now. There are only hints. So three flavor neutrino mixing. The matrix, mixing matrix here is a three by three matrix. U, alpha, I, where alpha takes the values E, mu, and tau, and I takes values 1, 2, and 3. So this is the explicit form for this. And in many cases, it's convenient to um, parameterize this matrix in terms of the mixing <coughs> angles and the phase. In order to be able to extract them from the experiment, it's very convenient to have uh, the expression for this in terms of the mixing parameters. Uh, then we will have the standard oscillation formula, as I described before. And the oscillation, uh, sorry, the, the mixing matrix can be written as a product of three rotation, and one of them including NCP phase. So this is the rotation in the 2, 3 plane, rotation in 1, 3 plane, modified by the CP violating phase, and rotation in the 1, 2 plane. Of course, it's not unique, this representation. It's just one of many possible representations. But it is very convenient one, a very convenient one, and it is commonly used one. It's now called the standard parameterization. You can find it in the particle data group, uh, um, and that's what is now used by essentially everyone. Long ago, people were using different con convention, and it was a mess. Now everyone uses this convention. Now, if we multiply these three matrices, the result is here. Again, you can find it in the particle data group uh, uh, listing. Okay. Now, what is what here? Each line gives us a composition of neutrino flavor eigenstate, nu e here, nu mu second line, and nu tau here in terms of nu1, nu2, and nu3. The amplitudes of contribution nu1 and nu2, nu3, for example, into the electron neutrino state. Each column gives us the contribution of given flavor state into a, a given mass eigenstate. So this is the, the composition of the mass eigenstate nu1, this is the composition of mass eigenstate nu2, and this is nu3. And the weights of nu e, nu mu, and nu tau are given by square moduli of the corresponding elements of the mixing matrix. For example, for the third mass eigenstate, the composition, the, the at mixture of electron neutrino is given by sine square of theta 1, 3. For muon and tau, it's sine square, cosine square theta 1, 3. In the first case, it's multiplied by sine square theta 2, 3. In the second, by cosine square theta 2, 3. And since theta 2, 3 is relatively close to 45 degrees, these two numbers are very close to each other, which means that the third neutrino mass eigenstate has nearly the same composition in terms of muon and tau neutrinos. The weight of muon and tau neutrinos in the third mass eigenstate is nearly the same. And the weight of electron neutrino is small because theta one sine of theta one three squared is about two percent only. Now a very convenient and illuminating representation of this given by these diagrams. Okay? So what we have here is the mass eigenstate with masses m1 square, m2 square, and m3 square in terms of the flavor states. 
by the way, we have two heavy states and one light state, or two light state and two heavy state, and we don't know which situation we r have in reality. <coughs> the neutrino oscillation experiment, as we discussed, can only measure delta m squared, mass squared differences. They cannot measure absolute masses. So we know that there is one large mass square difference and one small mass square difference. But we don't know whether the two states separated by the small, uh, well, it's are light states or they are heavy states. This situation is called the normal ordering, sometimes called normal hierarchy. Uh, and uh, this one is called the inverted ordering or inverted hierarchy. The term hierarchy is not very correct one <coughs> because we don't, just a minute, we don't really know how far this is from zero. If it is very close to zero, then it's indeed a hierarchy. If it is far from zero, then it's the, all the mass states are nearly degenerate, and only the ordering has some hierarchy. OK, question. Yeah, it's possible to derive some information about the masses for the flavors. For example, if I look on the, li uh, on the left picture, one could assume that the tau neutrino is uh, much uh, uh, heavier than the upper group. Was it not possible from its decomposition? Sorry, can, can you speak up a little bit? So the point is that flavor, I can say, don't have any mass at all. So that's an important point, sometimes forgotten. It's incorrect to say that electron neutrino is lighter than tau neutrino. They, it doesn't have any mass at all. It's a mixture of different mass against states. OK, so what we can see here is the following. Uh, in the case of the normal mass ordering, the heaviest mass again state is composed nearly of nearly equal amount of muon and tau neutrino, a small component of the electron neutrino. In the inverted ordering, this state is here. It's exactly the same composition, but it is the lightest one. Next, we have two lighter states here, or two heavier states here, in which the upper, the more heavy state, uh, contains nearly equal amount of electron, muon, and tau flavor. And the lower one contains about two thirds of electron neutrino. And the remaining one third is uh, nearly one half of muon and one half of tau neutrinos. So we don't know whether this one is below or above. But we do know that in this pair, which is separated by the smaller mass square differences, the lower state always contains bigger fraction of electron neutrino. This we already know. And the way we, we learn this is from the solar neutrino problem. The solar neutrino problem is solved through the MSW effect, through the matter enhanced neutrino oscillations. <laughs> and this um, resonant enhancement of neutrino oscillations, which I was planning to discuss today, but probably will have to discuss mostly tomorrow, uh, depends on the flavor composition in such a way that uh, we know by now that the lowest of the state contains more uh, electron, bigger contribution of electron neutrino than the higher state. Otherwise, we would have enhancement for antineutrinos and not for neutrinos. And we wouldn't have the solution of the solar neutrino problem, which we have by now. Next thing, uh, what are the physically allowed ranges of parameters for neutrino mixing. Let's start with a two flavor case. We know this relation between neutrino flavor state and mass again state, nu1, nu2. In general, the mixing angle theta can take any value between 0 and 2 pi. However, in reality, the situation is much simpler. Assume we consider the transformation theta into theta plus pi. In this case, uh, cosine changes its sign, and sign changes its sign. However, if we simultaneously change the sign of nu1 and nu2, these two relations remain unchanged. So if we replace nu1 by minus nu1 and nu2 by minus nu2, then we, we can always transform theta into theta plus pi. By the way, are we allowed really to do it? Yes, of course, because 
the neutrino fields always enter into the Lagrangian uh, like squares in the kinetic term and in the mass term. So we can always do that without changing anything. And this means that out of the full 2 pi range, we can take only one half of it because of this transformation. Only one half of this has some physical meaning. Okay? And therefore, instead of 0 to pi, we can take, for example, minus pi over 2, pi over 2. Just one half. Next, if we change theta into minus theta, this would mean that cosine remains the same, but sine changes the sign. Uh, so we have to change the sign of nu2 here. Then this first equation will remain unchanged. But if we change the sign of nu2, this will change sign. And this also changes sign because s uh, sine theta changes sign. So we have in addition to change the sign of nu mu into minus nu mu. Again, are we allowed to do this? Nu mu enters into charged current Lagrangian. And if we change it, are we actually allowed to do this? Okay. The answer is, since it's multiplied by the neutrino field, it cancels in this expression. So again, we are allowed to do this. Okay. Now, by doing this transformation, we can reduce the allowed physical range of theta from minus pi over 2 pi over 2 to 0 pi over 2. And then lastly, we can change theta into pi over 2 minus theta, which means interchanging sine and cosine. Then we can also interchange nu1 and nu2. <coughs> and we, as we see from this, we, can also, we need also to change the sine of nu mu to minus nu mu. And changing, interchanging nu1 and nu2 means that we change the sine of delta m squared. This means that by we can always choose delta m squared to be positive by appropriately choosing uh, theta within the interval from 0 to pi over 2. So we reduce the allowed physical ranges of parameters by doing this. In the case of vacuum oscillation, the oscillation is, uh, uh, transition and survival probabilities depend only on the factor sine squared 2 theta, which means that we can further reduce the allowed values of theta to the interval 0 to pi over 4. However, this is only possible for vacuum oscillation. If we consider oscillations in matter, that's not correct. So in general, this shouldn't be done. Now, we can do similar, use similar considerations for the three flavor case. And the outcome is that the allowed ranges of the mixing angles are between 0 and pi over 2. And for delta Cp is the full interval between 0 and 2 pi. Questions? No. Okay. So coming back to this, I'm not sure if th this point was uh, actually clear, whether we can change the, the... Is it clear for the three paper case? For which case? Uh, it doesn't matter. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Because uh, if we have just Majorana neutrinos, uh, then the, the mixing matrix has exactly the same parameterization. The oscillation probability have exactly the same form. We cannot distinguish between Majorana and Dirac neutrinos by oscillations. Only if they are sterile neutrinos, the situation is different. But then there are more parameters. The mixing ma matrix is not 3 by 3 matrix anymore. So it's a completely different situation if they are sterile neutrinos. If the Majorana, neutrinos are Majorana, but just the usual three neutrino flavors, exactly the same. But the Majorana phase? Majorana phases do not enter oscillations. I, I already dropped them. Yeah, but the, the, the physical range of the phase is not 0 to 2 pi, or is it 0 to 2 pi? OK. Well, uh, I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not sure if it is correct. Uh, I never thought because uh, of about this, because for oscillations, it's not important at all. Now, for uh, I think it's also not so important for my run phase because assume we, we ch have chosen some convention for, for this, it will also uh, reflect on the values of the Majorana phases. But we just take them in this con particular convention. <coughs> so we use this convention and we just c calculate the phases. Yeah. Now, uh, maybe I was not quite clear about this case. When we replace nu mu to minus nu mu, 
They also have to replace muon, charged muon field to minus charged muon field in the charged lepton uh, current in order to, to keep it invariant. And this will not change anything because the mass term for the muon, charged muon will not change in this case. Okay, I'm badly behind my schedule, but let me very quickly uh, discuss uh, the implications of CP and T violations in neutrino oscillations in vacuum. Okay. Uh, what can we say about properties, the oscillation probability in vacuum uh, with respect to CP and T transformations? As I discussed before, we can use the Schrodinger-like equation for neutrino evolution in vacuum and instead of considering neutrino evolution in space and time, we can either consider only in space or only in time, which I'm doing here, because uh, there's one-to-one -one correspondence for point-like neutrinos between the distance ne propagated by neutrinos and the time of their propagation. Okay? And then the oscillation probability is described by the formula which I discussed many times already. By now, <coughs> mu alpha, flavor alpha, produced at times t0, goes into new beta at time t, and the probability of this transition is given by this expression. Now let's see what happens if we apply CP and T transformation to this probability. CP transformation means that we have to replace particles by their antiparticles. In the neutrino case, we have to replace left-handed neutrino by right-handed antineutrinos. Okay? This also means that we have to replace the leptonic mixing matrix, but it complex conjugate because we go to the anti-neutrino fields. And this means that all Dirac type CP violating, well, in <coughs> the three flavor case, just one phase, but in general, n flavor case, uh, it's a set of Dirac type uh, CP violating phases. The number is n minus 1 times n minus 2 divided by 2. So all of them we have to flip if we make a CP violation. CP transformation. Now, on the CP transformation, the probability of new alpha go going into new beta will go into the probability new alpha star, uh, new alpha bar going into a new beta bar, so for antineutrinos. And this probability will be the same only if all the phases are zero. If they are not zero, the probability of oscillations between antineutrinos of a given flavor will not be the same as the probability of oscillations of neutrinos of this flavor. Okay? So because of the existence of the CP violating phases, CP is violated in neutrino oscillations. When they go from neutrinos to antineutrinos, the probability is not the same. How about time reversal? Yeah, question? Yeah? How about time reversal? Time reversal means that we should interchange the initial time, neutrino production, and neutrino detection time. This means that we have to change the sign of this difference, which is equivalent to complex conjugation of this exponential phase factor. But since we have the uh, absolute value of this here, of this form, it is equivalent to ch complex conjugation instead of this factor. We can complex conjugate these two factors. The result will be the same because of the absolute value. And complex conjugating these two factors is equivalent to interchanging alpha and beta. So time reversal is equivalent to interchanging initial and final flavor, which is kind of natural. So instead of nu e oscillating into nu mu, we'll have nu mu oscillating into nu e. And if CP violating phases are non-zero, this replacement means again that we change the flip the sign of all CP violating phases, just one in the three flavor case, but more than one if there are more than three flavors. And this means that under this transformation, if the CP violating phases are not zero, again the probability changes. The probability of electron neutrino oscillating into muon neutrino is not the same as the probability of muon neutrino oscillating into electron neutrino. As I said, these phases are absent in the case of two flavors. And therefore, these interesting CP and T violating effects on neutrino oscillations can only exist if there are three flavors or more. So in the three flavor framework, they exist. Now, CPT. 
And the CPT neutrinos go into antineutrinos and also we interchange the initial and final flavor. And therefore, uh, the probability of new alpha going into new beta goes into the probability of new beta bar going into new alpha bar. So anti-new beta oscillating into new beta. And in all normal theories, CPT is conserved. Normal, I mean, Lagrangian local uh, theories with the correct relation between spin and statistics. Okay? Uh, and we are based on such a theory, so we expect CPT to be conserved. And therefore, we expect that, that these two probabilities should be actually equal to each other. And if we apply CP and T transformation, which I discussed just a few minutes ago, we will immediately see that indeed this relation is satisfied. So the probability of new alpha going into new beta is re equal to the probability of anti new beta going into anti new alpha. Now we can define the CP odd difference of oscillation probabilities as p of new alpha to new beta minus p of new alpha bar into new beta bar and t odd probabilities as p of new alpha to new beta minus p of new beta to new alpha. And from CPT it follows that these two type of differences are equal to each other and also that the survival probability is always CP even, doesn't have any CP violating part because it's the same as as uh, time rever uh, reversal probability. And for time reversal for alpha beta, just interchange alpha and beta. And since uh, in the diagonal term beta is equal to alpha, nothing changes. Okay, okay can I have a few more minutes? Okay. Who is sharing? Okay, okay. so uh, just to finish this situation. In the standard three flavor case, it's very easy to calculate this uh, CP odd and T odd os oscillation probabilities. And they are given by this expression. First of all, if we change the flavor indices cyclically, P e mu, P mu tau, P tau e, they are all equal to each other. There's only one CP violating phase and there's only one CP odd probability <coughs> difference. And this delta P is given by this expression. The factor here contains sines and cosines of all the mixing angles and contains sine of the CP violating phase. And it's called Yarskog invariant because of the similar invariant in the quark physics, even though it doesn't look exactly the same as it is in quark physics. And it is multiplied by the sum of three oscillating sines. Look here, it's a, an important difference with respect to the usual two flavor case. Instead of sine square, we have sines here, not sine squared. Okay. And it, it can be immediately seen that if at least one delta m square is zero, for example, delta m1 2 is zero, then these two are opposite of each other and they cancel exactly. So this expression is only non-zero if all two mass square differences are non-zero. If at least one of them is zero, there is no CP violation. It is zero if at least one mixing angle is zero, or pi over two, 90 degrees, then again it vanishes. And of course it's zero if delta CP is either zero or, or 180 degrees. Also it is zero in the averaging regime. If the phases here are very large, we have to average them. And since it's not sine square, but sine, the average is zero. So in the averaging regime, everything is zero. Moreover, in the regime of small baseline, we can expand sine and just take the arg instead of sine its argument. And if we take the sum of all the three of them, they exactly cancel each other. <coughs> so there are many limiting cases in which there is no CP violation. And it's one thing which shows us that it's very, very difficult actually to observe CP violation. Okay, I think I will stop here. Questions? Um, given that, I mean, we, we know that all those criteria are met, how difficult is it actually to observe, say, you have a large L? I mean, we, we know what all the angles are apart from you, you mean CP violation? Yeah. yeah. Um, the way we are trying to probe CP violation now is not by comparing 
oscillation probabilities for neutrinos and antineutrinos. But just by making some global fit of all parameters. So the oscillation probability, even not CP, CP or difference, but the probability itself, depends on all the parameters, including the phase. And if we manage to accurately extract from the experiment all these parameters, we should be able also to measure the phase. Of course, if we can compare neutrino and antineutrino channels, it makes our life easier. So the sensitivity to the CP violation parameter is increased. But in reality, we have to fit all the parameters simultaneously. And this is the way how CP violation is extracted now. Another problem which I will discuss tomorrow, that in the accelerator experiments, for example, neutrinos propagate within the Earth, within the matter of the Earth. And then uh, the oscillations are affected by matter. And matter by itself violates CP because it consists, we have usual matter, not equal amount of matter and antimatter. Because of the MSW effect, matter can mimic CP violation even if it is not there. And we have to take this into account. So it is not an easy business at all.